Good afternoon, St. Matthew, and Happy New Year. Uh, shortly, you will be watching a pre-recorded sermon from several years ago. Uh, we have, for the month of January, decided to use pre-recorded services uh, for our Sunday worship. Um, these are all services that were hand-picked by Max and edited by Stephen more and I want to um, thank you both for the blessing that we will receive from these recorded services. But I also want you to know that just because we are offering recorded services, it does not mean we have gone anywhere. The church is still alive, the church is still working, and the staff of the church are still available to you should you need anything. Uh, I can be reached by email or text or telephone and Max as well, and so please do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, as we uh, celebrate a new year, I would like to offer you uh, just a brief uh, passage of Scripture. Uh, it's not the whole Psalm 139, but it's part of it. Psalm 139 is my favorite psalm and probably some of my favorite Scripture in the Bible. And so as you begin 2021, Please uh, accept this offering from me. O oh Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and you know when I get up. And you understand everything I'm thinking. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and you are intimately acquainted with all of my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me from behind everywhere that I have been, and you have already walked everywhere where I am going, and you have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high, I cannot understand it. Where do I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, you're there, if I make my bed in shoal, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night. For even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same thing to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And as I close this message, I offer this prayer. It's from our hymn book, hymn 607. It's called a covenant prayer in the Wesleyan tradition. And so as we begin this new year, I offer this covenant prayer. I am no longer my own but yours. Put me to doing what you will. Put me standing beside whoever you will. Put me to doing and put me to working. Let me be employed by you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things or let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. God bless you and keep you in this new year. And may the overwhelming, never-ending, precious love of God be fully present in your life. Amen.
Apostle Paul begins his greatest letter, the letter to the Romans on grace, with some words about judgment. And if we don't understand judgment, there's no way in the world that we will ever come to understand grace. He goes through a long catalog of sins. We'll come in on the end of it here. And since they did not see fit, since people did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to base mind and to improper conduct. They were filled with all manner of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity. They were gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but approve those who practice them. Therefore, you have no excuse, O people. Whoever you are, when you judge another, for in passing judgment upon him, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, are doing the very same thing. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who do such things. Do you suppose, O oh people, that when you judge those who do such things and you do them yourselves, you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume upon the riches of his kindness and the forbearance and patience? Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But by your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. I share with you in the sermon this morning concerning excused or forgiven, which do we want to be? Shut the door, keep out the devil. Shut the door, keep the devil in the night. Shut the door, keep out the devil. Light the candle, everything's all right. Light the candle, everything's all right. Oh, when I was a baby child. Shut the door, keep out the devil. Good and bad was just a game. Shut the door, keep the devil in the night. Shut 
gospel reading this morning is taken from the gospel of Luke chapter 14 verses 15 through 24 when one of those who sat at table with him heard this he said to him blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God but he said to him a man once gave a great banquet and invited many and at the time for the banquet he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited Come, for all is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. To first, the first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. I pray you, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five, five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. I pray you, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported this to his master. Then the, household, the householder in anger said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and maimed and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. I'd hate to miss a party. It's interesting that our Lord talked about, that he talked about the kingdom of heaven as a party. Remember uh, the prodigal son when he returned home. They had a big celebration, they had a big party. Celebration was big with our Lord. I think of worship each Sunday morning as celebration. This is the best party I come to on a regular basis. And I feel it too, I feel it. I feel a party spirit, what I call a party spirit when I gather here, and it makes me feel good. But before you get to the party, there are some other things that you have to consider. You have to get people to say yes. You have to get people to know that there's a party going on. You have to get them to understand that they're not living the party right where they are. There are a lot of people who think they're involved in a great party, and really it's just, it's just a kind of a death and a dying, and they don't even know it. They don't even wake up enough to know that they've been asleep. They don't even see enough of the light to know that they're standing in the darkness. And the Apostle Paul wanted to shake people up. And he did it in an extraordinary, extraordinary way. I think it's, it's, it's interesting that in this great letter on grace, this sermon on grace that Paul sends to the Roman church, that he begins it by talking about all these words of these judgments, these, this list of, of sins, this talk about uh, malignity. He, he, he makes sin look about as ugly as it can get and he goes through this list of murder, strife and deceit and slander and uh, haters of God and uh, disobedient and foolish. Foolish, faithless, heartless and ruthless. And who in the world would like to be like that? Well we say we, we, we and he talks in that about, about the, the uh, storing up uh, 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 these things against the day of wrath which will be uh, poured out 
I wonder why Paul begins this letter on grace by talking about wrath. Why do I begin this sermon today, on, which is on grace, talking about all of these uh, terrible things? I mean, after all, isn't God the God of love? Indeed, God is the God of love, a love so profound, a love so deep, a love so extraordinary, a love so inexhaustible that we don't even have any words for it. All we can do in talking about God's love is to point to that man bleeding and dying on the cross and say, God so loved the world. We don't even have words to express the depth of God's love and God's grace. But let me tell you what God does not love. We can even understand that God, in his extraordinary grace, loved Adolf Hitler. But God does not love the gas ovens. God did not love the actions of the man who sent millions to death. God may love the man who commits the murder. He does not love the murder itself. God may love, we can understand, Deng Xiaoping, and we can affirm indeed that he does. But he doesn't love the gunning down of those innocent students in the street. He doesn't love the horror. He doesn't love the terror. There is a judgment against that in this world. There is a wrath against that in this world. And the Hitlers and the Deng Xiaopings of this world may say, I have won the battle and I am a victor. But there is a judgment that stands against all of that and nothing can waive this judgment. You may can postpone it a little bit, but you cannot postpone it for long. And this is what Paul is telling us. You know, we have trivialized sin in our day and time, so that sin for us so often is a woman who wears her skirt too far above the knee or has on too much makeup, that kind of thing, as if women didn't have a right to dress and to put whatever much makeup they want to wear. That is not what we're talking about when the scripture talks about sin. It's talking about that power within us. We talk about uh, we talk about the small, the small failings as though they're great things and, and the great horrors of this world, we talk about them as though they don't even apply to the, to the word sin. We have somehow lost the meaning of this word and we have forgotten that sin is a power. It's the power of division, of hatred and animosity in this world. It's what drives that force against those students in China. It's what drove the Jewish people into those into those gas ovens uh, uh, before the troops. Sin is a power, and we don't need to trivialize it in any way. It does come in our lives in big ways and small, and we need to be aware when it's there, but we also need to be aware that it is a power in this world. I went to a service once, and, I, uh, and I, it was a service where the sermon was on love. And some people just love to hear sermons on sin because they think it's always talking about somebody else's sin. And we don't mind anyone talking about somebody else's sin, you know. I went to a service, it was a Presbyterian church, and it was a good sermon on love and grace. And the pastor in the midst of this sermon on love and grace just happened to glance past that word sin. He just happened to mention it in the midst of a, of a sentence and some guests in the back of the church from another denomination. The gentleman said, Amen! Just, he was just waiting for that word sin so he could say, Amen! Because, of course, it was bound to be somebody else's sin that was being talked about, and it couldn't possibly have been his sin. It was somebody else who, I heard a man talking this week. You know, when I don't, I don't talk about hell very much in my sermons. Our Lord didn't talk about hell very much. And when he did, he spoke a very figurative language. All right, I picture, I picture that there is a, a chance for people to be separated from the grace of God if that's what they choose. And he used the figurative language for hell about the burning and all of that. I heard a man talking this week who said, ah, boy, says, I believe in hell. Well, that's not for me a declaration of faith, all right? And he was thinking about all the people who wanted to go there. I believe in hell and I believe it's hot. And now I know some people are gonna end up there. They don't know it, but they're gonna end up there and they're gonna burn. Well, you see, all of these threats in the scriptures, as long as we deflect them all to somebody else, it's not gonna do us much good. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> there was a story about a fellow in the Old West who uh, uh, came into Dodge City and went into the saloon there. There were a whole bunch of people there, including a Texan sitting at the bar. And this uh, gunman came in the door and he said, all right, pulled his gun. All oh, you dirty, low-down, lily-livered scoundrels, clear out this place. And everybody left except the Texan. The Texan looked around and said, sure was a bunch of them, wasn't it? <laughs> 
Well, this man sitting in that worship service, the preacher said, sin. He said, amen. Whole bunch of it in the world and ain't none of it mine. Paul knew what he was doing. Bless his heart. Bless his heart, I love him. What he was going to do with this great work on grace is he wasn't going to let people sneak out that way. And he was going to give them something they wanted to hear. He was going to give them this bit on sin and he was going to list the ugliest ones he could think about. And they would be sitting there reading his letter. These letters were to be read in the churches. And they were sitting there saying, Amen to that! Those murderers, those nasty people, Amen to that! We've got a hell for them. But then he says, Therefore, you, he says to them. What did he say? He says, therefore, you, O people, have no excuse. Whoever you are, when you judge another, for in passing judgment upon him who condemns yourself, because you judge, you who judge, are doing the very thing for which you judge the other. He doesn't even go on to prove it. He just states it. He wants people to understand, and he wants them to see that there is no goodness, real goodness, apart from God. And they were sitting there saying, sock it to him, sock it to him, and then they found him socking it to them. And they were suddenly on the receiving end of it. But you know how we get around looking at our own lives and seeing the failings there. I was sitting at annual conference this week. You know, I've been on the diet since 1923. <laughs> I was sitting there at annual conference, and I was, uh, I was tired, and I was sleepy, and I don't want to go to sleep with the bishop looking. So I had me a Coca-Cola there, and I had me a little jelly roll, just a small jelly roll with the little stuff in the middle of it, and a little icing on the side. Of it. Not, not, just, well. <laughs> and I was sitting there each eating it, and the meeting was droning on about something, and I was having a good time. Roy looked over at me and said, I thought you were on a diet. I said, well, Roy, I am on a diet. I said, but I'm tired this morning, and I'm, I'm very sleepy. I, I just can't stay awake. He said, it's always easy to make excuses, isn't it? There, I, I, I thought that with the bishop up there, I was away from the judgment of the Lord, you see. But here, it was right beside me. And I was made uh, to look upon my sin, and I finished that thing fast. <laughs> Lest the Lord take extended notice of what was going on, you see, and remember all of my faithful promises. We hedge ourselves about with our excuses. Oh yes, I have failed to love as I should have loved, but Lord, you know my situation. I have not followed you with all my heart, but you know my situation, it's difficult for me. You know my upbringing, I've had a hard time. We go through all of these excuses for the way in which we live and the extent to which we have forgotten the Lord because we are so intent on painting a pretty picture for the world. He used to go to a Chinese restaurant. I went, I got, a, I got a fortune the other day in a Chinese restaurant, which was absolutely extraordinary. It was, it was, it was a lie. They're putting out lies now. I heard about, listen, th there was one, this has nothing to do with the sermon. I'll just tell you this in passing, then you can throw it out because it doesn't fit in here. There was a fortune cookie company that made obscene fortune cookie things and also they made decent ones. Well, one day they got all mixed up. And they went out into the world and there were people in perfectly decent restaurants opening, finding these obscene fortune cookies. Uh, well, I got something that was almost obscene. It was just a plain, it said on my fortune cookie, in my little fortune, you can have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> well, I was trying that at the annual conference and the word of the Lord spoke to me through Roy and it's not true. We used to go to this place, though, this Chinese restaurant, several of us in a group, and if one didn't get it one week, another one get it. It was a judgmental statement. It said, you, the Lord gave you one face, and you have painted for yourself another. Now, that's a word of judgment, and we'd get a big laugh out of that, and if I, if I got it, somebody laughed. You have, the Lord gave you one face, and you have made for yourself 
and other word of judgment kind of thing. This is what we do in life. We're always worried about what the world is going to think. If we can just look good in the eyes of the world, whatever we do, if we can just make it look good, if we can rack up enough excuses to make it look all right, then we'll be fine. Here's the only problem. You can fool all of the people some of the time, and you can fool some of the people all the time. Some folks just slow, I guess. But you can't fool all the people all the time, and you can't fool God, and you cannot fool yourself. What Paul wanted people to know is that without God, you can't get there. You can put on the facade and you can make all of the excuses, but the only thing that works is a life in which you have been willing to admit, precious Lord, I am weak. We hate to admit that we're weak, don't we? We hate to admit that we cannot get along without his strength. We even hate to show our feelings. We hate to let a tear fall, even with all that there is to cry about in this world. We hide our emotions. We hide behind the facade. But the only way that we can become true disciples of Jesus Christ is to yield our lives knowing that all that we are and hope to be depends on God. And we don't get there on our own. We don't get there even on our own goodness. I pray that through the God's grace in our life, we will be as good as we can, but we'll never be good enough. Paul wanted us to know that when that man died on that cross, that when that grace reaches to us, it is a gift. It's not earned, it's not deserved. As long as we think we deserve it, we'll never know the joy. It is a gift. And I think if we will look at our own lives and be willing to admit our own inadequacies, don't hide them anymore. You can hide them from your neighbor a little longer, but you can't hide them forever from God and from yourself. Don't even try. Don't be ashamed of failure because we're all going to fail and we've all failed and we'll fail again. We need not be ashamed of weakness. The only strength that we have that is of any use and that is lasting is the strength that we get from God. The only salvation we can find is from God. The only source of grace is God. But here is the good word. That grace is sufficient. It will not only pull you through, it will pull you through to joy and to thanksgiving. And the more I think we feel we do not deserve it, the more thankful we are when we know we've received it. I want to tell you now, on behalf of the Apostle Paul and our Lord Jesus Christ, we don't deserve it. And I want to tell you, we have received it. God is on your side. You belong to the Lord. Whether you live or whether you die, you are His. And He will care for you if you will let him. We're going to sing together a song about our weakness and God's strength. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Help me stand. Why? Because I am weak and I am tired and I am worn. Will you in this moment, as you sing this, and if it doesn't happen now, let it happen later, give your life again, once again, indeed, to him. That is the Lord.
can we affirm our faith together in these great words. We believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He rejoiced that God has reached to us in love, and we rest our lives in that grace which is ours through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.